we aren't able to meet together in convention at the Seawalk Farm, so I thought I would maybe review a lesson taken from the Bible from the world of agriculture. As we know, many spiritual lessons from God's words are taken from the farms of the Bible. So I have entitled our thoughts this morning, Shepherds on a Plain. Have you all experienced that after a convention, you are presented with opportunities to share the gospel message with others during your travels home? I think this is so because you had been filling your hearts and your minds with God's word and with his spirit through study and fellowship with the Lord's people. This filling of the spirit seems to increase our zeal and loosen our lips when we are given the opportunity in sharing the gospel of hope from the Bible with others. For our service this hour, I will share with you a tremendous blessing I received sharing God's word when I met shepherds on a plane. Just prior to the COVID-19 international travel restrictions, I attended the Orlando, Florida Bible Convention that was held in the first weekend in March. My final flight home to Saskatchewan left Toronto Pearson Airport at 9 p.m. I was seated in the Nile seat and I was hoping that I would be the only person to sit in my row. But my hope wasn't realized when a late boarding couple stopped at my row and began to sat down beside me. I could tell by their clothing that the husband and wife must be employed in agriculture. We struck up a conversation right away, so I surmised that they were farmers because they were very friendly and down-to-earth people. The husband asked me, so were you on business in Toronto? I said, no, I wasn't. I spent the weekend in Orlando, Florida. Really, he said. So did you go to Cape Canaveral or Disney World? No, I didn't get a chance to, I replied. I was attending a Bible student convention that I was invited to speak at. I then asked him, so were you, are you on your way home from Orlando as well? No, he said. My wife and I were visiting my son in Toronto. And then he asked me, where are you from? I told him that I lived in Yorkton. He said, oh, small world. I go to Yorkton every third Friday for the sheep and goat sale at Heartland Livestock Services. My wife and I raise sheep and goats west of Moose Jaw. Well, that really surprised me. And I said, I have never met a shepherd before. How did you get your rod and your staff through airport security? He chuckled at that and he said, well, I have sheep dogs and a donkey instead. Our meeting prompted questions and discussion about sheep and his occupation as a shepherd. One interesting thing I learned about sheep was when he said, I have been shepherding long enough that I discovered that sheep can talk to each other. They really do. I learned this at feeding time when I watched the sheep talk to one another. In the back of my mind, I said to myself, that sounds just like the Bible students. They all like to talk and visit too. Like sheep, they flock together to meetings and conventions and love to talk about their spiritual food in love and support of one another. And haven't all of you experienced that the best conventions we attend are those where we have had blessed and sweet fellowship with our dear brethren. This is a big reason why the COVID pandemic has been such a difficult time for all of us because we're being isolated from our families and from our brethren. But there has been a silver lining to this dark cloud. The Lord has blessed us because we are still able to talk and communicate with one another through phone calls, texts, and emails. And we have now been provided with the online video conferencing oh, yeah, such as in which we can host meetings and That's conventions. Right. We are very right. thankful for the services and the efforts provided by the Saskatoon and Prince Albert brethren on our behalf so that we could meet and communicate here this weekend. 
This fact of the importance of maintaining communication in our present situation reminds me of a scripture found in the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. And we will read Malachi 3, verses 16 and 17. Malachi 3, verses 16, 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So as my flight and conversation with the shepherds continued, my mind began to swirl. I couldn't help but think of all the many wonderful and powerful examples and pictures and lessons that involve shepherds and sheep that are found in the scriptures. I felt that this provided a great opportunity to share some of God's word with him. To test his interest, I said to him, did you know that some of the most famous people in the Bible were shepherds? Not really, he replied. I haven't gone to church since I was in Sunday school. So I began telling him that some of the most famous prophets of the Old Testament, such as Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and King David, were all shepherds. Also, I said, it was to the shepherds who were watching their flocks by night that God chose the honor of being the first people to receive the tidings of great joy from the holy angels about the birth of our Lord Jesus. Next, I added, you know, David was a very brave shepherd. He loved his sheep and his lambs very much. You might, might remember that when David was just a young boy shepherding his father's flock, he was the only one in all of Israel who was brave enough to face the giant Goliath in battle. David told King Saul that he wasn't afraid to face Goliath because while shepherding his father's sheep, whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, he would go after him, attack him, and rescue the lamb. David had killed both a lion and a bear in order to protect his flock. Next, I shared with the shepherds that the Old Testament has many examples of sheep and lambs that were pictures of our Lord Jesus in the future. One example was the Passover lamb. On the night of Israel's Passover, God commanded the Israelites to slay an unblemished lamb and use its blood to rescue them from the angel of death, which preceded their rescue out of slavery from Pharaoh in Egypt. Another example I mentioned was when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. As Abraham raised his knife to sacrifice Isaac, an angel stopped his hand, and then God provided a male sheep in his place. This too, I said, was a picture of another future event. Abraham, who represents God, would one day offer his son Jesus in sacrifice to die for Adam and all mankind. The shepherds were listening intently, so I asked them a question. I asked, you know, lambs and sheep are such cute animals. Don't you find it hard to slaughter them for food when the time comes? In the reply, the shepherd said, no, as a livestock producer, the animals are my economic livelihood, so you get past that emotion. We do slaughter them in a very humane way. And next, he told me something that really caught my attention. He said, but I'll tell you one thing. I have been a shepherd for 30 years, and not once when I slaughtered his sheep did they ever fight or make any noise. They would just lay on their backs real docile and quiet while we killed them. 
But goats, on the other hand, he said, are totally opposite. When you butcher a goat, they make a heck of a noise, crying out at the top of their lungs. Plus, they squirm and they fight to get away from you during the entire process. When I heard that, I replied, wow, that is a very important illustration. Did you know that the Old Testament foretold that on the night before Jesus' crucifixion, it says that he would be like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. Jesus was innocent of all charges against him, but he did not open his mouth. He was silent before the high priest, Herod, and Pontius Pilate in order to change their verdict. Jesus didn't plead to save himself from the sacrificial death which he knew he had to perform. As my conversation with the shepherds continued on the plane, later the husband said, well, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to have a nap now. It's been a very long day. Of course, I said, I think I will have a nap myself. I closed my eyes, but I couldn't sleep. I was so enthused about this conversation with the shepherds that my brain just wouldn't shut off. My mind was contemplating all of those scriptural examples of shepherds and sheep and their meanings and how I was really interested in reviewing them again when I got home. I thought of how Abel was the first shepherd mentioned in the Bible and his acceptable sacrifice pictured the future sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. And the people of Genesis afterwards, as a form of worship, kept offering Abel's acceptable sacrifice as well. A flock, one of the flock to God. I also thought of the deeper pictures in the story of Abraham and Isaac. Shepherds and sheep are both involved in this story. Here, God foreshadows the central event to accomplish his divine plan of the ages, his own sacrifice of his only begotten son, the ransom, the central hub to all of God's plans and purposes. We remember that in Genesis chapter 22, God commanded Abraham to travel to Moriah and offer his only son Isaac as a burnt offering sacrifice. So Abraham here again represents God, and Isaac represents the man, Christ Jesus. We read that it was a three-day journey for Abraham, Isaac, and the two young men that joined them to journey to Moriah. Knowing that he would have to sacrifice his only son when he arrived, we wonder at what thoughts were being pondered in Abraham's mind as he journeyed for these three long days. Just think of our Heavenly Father, who not for three 24-hour earthly days, but it must have been for eons of time, knew that he would one day need to slay his only begotten son. Revelation 13 verse 8. Revelation 13 verse 8 tells us that Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. The apostle Peter also tells us that we weren't redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown again before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in the last times for you. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. Genesis chapter 22 also tells us that Abraham told the two young men traveling with them to stay behind while they went to worship the Lord. These two young men then could represent Jesus' own disciples. We remember that after Jesus' arrest in Gethsemane, 
his own disciples stayed behind and they deserted him. For they were in grave fear. They didn't have the Holy Spirit at this time to make them strong in their faith. Abraham also told the two men, we will return to you. This tells us that Abraham had faith that God would be able to raise his son from the dead after obeying his will to sacrifice Isaac because God's promises to Abraham of blessing all the families of the earth were to be through his son. Next, we read in Genesis 22 that Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid the wood upon Isaac's back. This pictures the cross of wood that our Lord Jesus was forced to carry on his way to his cruel cross on Calvary. And we remember too that in the law, burnt offerings were always to be laid upon wood, picturing the cross, representing the ransom sacrifice of Jesus. So Abraham took the fire and the knife and the two of them walked on together. Isaac then asked Abraham, my father, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham replied, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. We remember how God's only begotten son, the firstborn of all creation, the Logos, who was daily his father's delight, obeyed his father's request, and had his perfect spiritual life transformed into the womb of the Virgin Mary in order to be born as a perfect human baby and grow to the full stature of a perfect man. Paul wrote of this fact in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrews 2, verse 14, we read, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus, himself, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. When Jesus was beginning his ministry, he went to be baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Here, John described Jesus as the Lamb of God that take away the sin, singular, of the world. It was Adam's sin he gave his life as a ransom, a corresponding price, a perfect human life for a perfect human life, so that all mankind one day could then be saved from Adamic death. Paul explains this in a portion of Romans chapter 5. We will read Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through one man's disobedience, Adam's, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the man Christ Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Returning back now to our narrative in Genesis chapter 22, we read that Abraham built the altar where God appointed, arranged the wood, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Here we see how submissive Isaac was to his father, Abraham, as he was being tied to the altar, being prepared to have his life taken in sacrifice. Isaac was a young man at this time, in his 30s, and could have easily overpowered his elderly father, Abraham, who was at least 130 years old at this time. This was demonstrated by Jesus, who was totally submissive to his father, 
during his great sacrifice. Just as that shepherd told me how the sheep behaved, being so, so submissive when they were slaughtered. The preparations for the burnt offering were now complete and the crucial moment now arrived. Abraham's obedience and faith were so strong in the promise of God centered in Isaac that with the firm conviction that God would restore his son's life again, Abraham raised his knife to offer up in death the dearest treasure of his heart. And at that crucial moment, now only a miraculous intervention could spare Isaac. And at this moment, an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said to Abraham, Abraham, do not stretch your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. When his hand was stayed, it was indeed as if Abraham had received a son again from the dead. The Apostle Paul said that he received him in a figure. Yes, a picture was being enacted, foreshadowing a future darker day to come for another father and another son. A son who, like Isaac, was an only son, greatly beloved and an heir of the promise. Who, like Isaac, would have such great trust and faith in his father, so submissive that he would willingly consent to die, even the cruel death on a cross. Jesus said, in John 10, verses 17 and 18. John 10, 17, 18. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. When the day finally came for this difficult experience to take place, the prophecy of Isaiah well described Jesus as that of a lamb being led to slaughter. Unlike with Isaac, the angel of the Lord was now instructed not to intervene. The 12 legions of angels, whom Jesus said would offer immediate help, should he request it, were called upon to stand aside and watch. Their former Logos, the man Christ Jesus, die on the cross at the brutal hands of sinful men. We can well imagine the great rejoicing of Isaac and Abraham as he lifted his son up from off the altar and received him back into his bosom. No less was there rejoicing in heaven when he who had proven faithful unto death was restored by the mighty power of his heavenly father and was resurrected and received a place at his own right hand, where it says to us in Revelation 5, verse 12. Revelation 5, verse 12 and 13 read, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and honor and glory and blessing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus told his disciples, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You know, today the kings of earth demand that their subjects die for them. King Jesus, instead, died for his subjects. The good shepherd has laid down his life for two different flocks of sheep, as we read in John chapter 10. The first flock has been made up of Jews and Gentiles, the prospective bride of Christ, who will become the Lamb's wife, the church, the bride of Christ. The Messiah, head and body, 
will then bless all the families of the earth through shepherding another flock, not of this fold. It will be all mankind on the human plane, likened as sheep. Here, the Christ, head and body, will mediate the new covenant as they resurrect the dead and restore them back to life and paradise. Up the highway of holiness in order to bring them back into covenant relationship with their one and only God and chief shepherd. A wonderful prophecy of the restoration of Israel and the whole world in the messianic age through the shepherding of the anti-typical David, Christ Jesus and his body members is found in Ezekiel chapter 34. In Ezekiel chapter 34, we are going to begin by reading verses 23 to 25. It reads, Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be their prince. And my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. This harmonizes with another Old Testament promise of this wonderful time in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 10. Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 10. And it reads, And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. We remember that Jesse is David's father. David is the antitypical Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. The good shepherd's peaceable kingdom picture continues in the book of Ezekiel chapter 34. Let us now read verses 26 to 31. Ezekiel 34 verses 26 to 31. And as we read, brethren, you're going to notice many familiar words and phrases that are found in many other Old Testament and New Testament millennial age promises. Let us read verses 26 to 31. I will make them and the places around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season. They will be showers of blessing. Also, the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure on their land. Then they will know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them, they will no longer be a prey to the nations, and the beasts of the earth will not devour them but they will live securely and no one will make them afraid. I will establish for them a renowned resting place and they will not again be victims of famine in the land and they will not endure the insults of the nations anymore. Then they will know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. As for you, my sheep, 
the sheep of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. So again, another wonderful promise for Israel and the whole world of mankind, which these scriptures portray. We're also familiar with the famous parable of Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And here is demonstrated the success that the good shepherd will have during the Meditori kingdom, which we previously read about in Isaiah chapter 11 and Ezekiel chapter 34. It tells us in this parable that the blessed of the father, which will inherit the kingdom as people on earth are called sheep. These sheep-like people demonstrated their godlike qualities of love through their unselfish good deeds of giving food, drink, clothing, and entertaining strangers during their walk up the highway of holiness. Here, love is so ingrained in their characters, in their hearts, that they had to ask the Lord that, when had we performed all of these good deeds? And the good shepherd replies to them, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. In closing and summary, though we are still isolated due to COVID-19, let us continue to keep ourselves filled with the Lord's spirit through his word by speaking to one another and listening to one another through phone calls, texts, emails, and our wonderful Zoom, which we have for video conferencing. For the Lord hears it, and he is writing your names in a book of remembrance because you are reverencing and esteeming his name as it's found in his great and precious promises and in his divine plan of the ages. God has provided many spiritual teachings and lessons in the lives of the shepherds and the sheep which are found in the Bible. The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world for the sin of the world has been found worthy to shepherd two classes of sheep, what we call the two salvations, first in this gospel age and then in the millennial ages to come, in order to bring all mankind into atonement and to bless them with eternal spiritual or earthly life. Furthermore, let's keep our vessels filled with God's word so that it may lead to opportunities for us to let our light shine, to share the gospel with those who may have a hearing ear, whether it be by word of mouth or in our actions. Let's now conclude by reading Psalms chapter 23. It is probably one of the most famous Psalms found in the scriptures. And it is a beautiful Psalm for the Lord's people. One for difficult times in which we are facing today. As gospel age sheep, let us continue to heed the voice of our good shepherd. This is how it reads, Psalms chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, 
goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've heard how this worldwide COVID pandemic, this birth pang, has stirred up the four winds of trouble in the social, financial, religious, and political systems we find ourselves in. But we have faith that the Lord of the harvest is restraining these four winds from blowing until the saints have been sealed on their foreheads. A final promise given to us from our good shepherd. And he is speaking, to, speaking this to us today where he says, Don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your father great pleasure to give you the kingdom. May the Lord add his blessing and overrule anything said amiss. So God be with you till we zoom again. <laughs>